Good afternoon, and thank you so much for being here today as we uh, worship God and celebrate the life of Jack Larkin. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, number one, uh, we will be singing three hymns today. Two of them are photocopied inserts that should be in your order of service. The third one, uh, In the Bleak Midwinter, typically a sort of December Christmas thing that was one of Jack's favorites, though. That will be found in this pilgrim hymnal, which will be in the rack in front of you, and it'll be hymn number 128 when we get there, just when it says hymn number 128. It's this book that it's referring to, to let you know that. And secondly, um, we have uh, several restrooms in the church. We have one up here on this floor, and there is a men's restroom at the bottom of the stairway on that side, a women's restroom at the bottom of the stairway on that side, and a third uh, male or female bathroom, just basically right down under here that you go downstairs and then come down this way. So there are plenty of restrooms and we will be having time for refreshments afterwards in what is called the Norman Room, which is that room at the back, of the, right out the sanctuary right there. So please hear the promises of God. God is near to all who call, who call from their hearts. The desires of those who fear God are fulfilled. Their cries are heard. They are saved. Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, behold, I am alive forevermore. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my victorious hand. Friends, we gather here in the protective shelter of God's healing love. We are free to pour out our grief, release our anger, face our emptiness, and know that God cares. We gather here as God's people, conscious of others who have died and of the frailty of our own existence on earth. We come to comfort and to support one another in our common loss. We gather to hear God's word of hope that can drive away our despair and move us to offer God our praise. We gather to commend to God with thanksgiving the life of Jack Larkin as we celebrate the good news of Christ's resurrection. For whether we live or whether we die, we belong to Christ, who is Lord both of the dead and the living. If you would please join me in a spirit of prayer. Holy God, whose ways are not our ways and whose thoughts are not our thoughts, grant that your Holy Spirit may intercede for us with sighs too deep for human words. Heal our wounded hearts made heavy by our sorrow. Through the veil of our tears and the silence of our emptiness, Assure us again that ear has not heard, nor eye seen, nor human imagination envisioned what you have prepared for those who loved you. Through Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead. Amen. I'd like to invite the choir to come forward for our first anthem. Oops. Did we go right by the first hymn? I am sorry. Before we ask the choir to come up here, I apologize. Let us sing, Won't You Let Me Be Your Servant. Please stand.
except for the choir. You may be seated.
The scripture lesson is from the Hebrew scripture, and it is that familiar psalm that you know by heart and you've heard so many times before. But I invite you to hear the words today as if you're hearing them for the first time, as if they were written just for you to bring comfort in this moment. So listen now to the word of God as it comes to us in these words. Psalm 23 from the Revised Standard Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still water. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. First, the next reading is from the Hebrew scripture also, uh, the prophet Micah, chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? A reading from Matthew, chapter 25, verses 34 through 40. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee, or thirsty and give thee drink? And when did we see thee a stranger and welcome thee, or naked and clothe thee? And when did we see thee sick or in prison and visit thee? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it for me.
afternoon. I'm speaking on behalf of Barbara's sister, Patty, uh, her family, and I'm her husband, John Sparks. Um, we've known Jack for about as long as Barbara has. Barbara, as many of you know, returned from Afghanistan in the Peace Corps and shortly afterwards moved here to Massachusetts where she was uh, in Head Start and met Jack at that time. And we, we were students at the time in Boston and had the opportunity to get to know Jack and to see Jack's love of Barbara grow and prosper and last these many, many years. We spent a lot of time together those first few years. We had a number of just wonderful times together, a few struggles here and there, and an occasional tragedy, but it was just a wonderful time and set the stage for a lifelong relationship with Jack and Barbara that we very much cherish and uh, have continued. As many of you know, Jack was a voracious reader. Uh, he could not pass something he had not read and let it be free. He had to read it and transcribe it into his mind and put it there in a way that he could share it with all of us in his own unique way. Whether it was history or a mystery, whether it was sci-fi or supermarket tabloid, Jack read every word that was put in front of him. Uh, he knew more about Princess Di and the soap operas than probably anybody I have ever met, frankly, because apparently there are long waits in the supermarkets around here. Um, he had the, it, more than just reading, though. He had an encyclopedic memory, and I think a unique ability to put things in his mind in a way that he could, on the fly, generate a lecture or a talk that was both informative and entertaining. Uh, he could educate all of us and did educate all of us on many occasions. He was the consummate teacher. Uh, his many years at Sturbridge Village, he was not only the chief historian, but really enjoyed getting out in front of everybody and helping everybody learn history and learn his passion, just as he had for many years. The, I, I should tell you I'm an academic myself and I have an incredible amount of respect for someone like Jack who has that native ability to teach. It's a rare thing and a wonderful gift for his students and for all of us <laughs> to be able to do that. Jack and Barbara and I, after we left Boston and Patty, stayed together always in heart, but occasionally in person as we traveled some distances often to see each other. And we shared some vacations early on in our um, uh, time. I remember a trip camping in the Rockies and we found some hoof prints in the, uh, in the uh, muddy trail that we were on. And as great naturalists that we knew we were, we saw a moose ahead of us, or we thought we did, and went tracking the elusive moose for probably about two hours, only to find it was a, a, a herd of cattle that had been uh, <laughs> there. And we, uh, we uh, remain great naturalists nonetheless. On a more recent trip, after the kids were uh, grown, we camped in the, Rock in the Smoky Mountains, and uh, Jack was writing a book on mills and and uh, um, water wheels at the time, and we, I think, saw every water wheel in the Great Smoky Mountains, whatever the distance or state of repair, and he uh, uh, made sure that the park rangers told him every ounce of information he could, learned a great deal about it. And more recently, uh, we've spent a fair amount of time together in Florida, uh, visiting Barbara and Patty's mother. Uh, often staying up late into the night to talk about any number of wonderful topics and just undescribable um, how, how wonderful the conversation was with, with Jack and Barbara. Uh, Patty and I have worked a little to try and think of words that describe Jack and a number that come to mind, um, kind, loving, humble, authentic, storyteller, educator, and just genuinely a great man, a wonderful guy, and could just wish the world were full of people like Jack, but it's a, just a, a treasure to know someone like Jack. They're rare, rare to come by. 
Barbara, I know Jack loved you greatly. Kids, I know he loved you guys greatly and the grandkids as well. And to all the rest of his family and friends, he had a great deal of love for everybody. He's a, a wonderfully caring and uh, wonderful man. Jack, I just want to let you know that you are much loved now, even now, um, by all of his family and friends, by Patty, by our family, and by me. Thank you. I'm Adelpha, I'm uh, Jack's father-in-law, Tim's wife. I still clearly remember my first time in the Larkin home. The smells of potatoes and pork roast wafting from the kitchen. The sounds of all things considered filling the house. <laughs> Jack and Barbara singing around the piano trying to master the new choir piece. <laughs> Tim and Dan making ridiculous jokes and word plays. Then all of us sitting around the table engaged in a deep discussion about great literary works and hilarious recounts of family vacations gone awry. I knew at that moment that I'd had, somehow had an incredible good fortune to be a part of something very special. And as I got to know the Larkins, I realized just what amazing human beings each was. Tim, the graceful, articulate, outgoing, sporty brainiac and love of my life. Dan, the gentle, kind, klutzy, brilliant, all around great guy. <laughs> Barbara, the family rock. Peace Corps volunteer, beautiful, graceful, intelligent, giving mother to all. And Jack, the absent-minded professor, the most brilliant person I've ever met, an amazing father and grandfather, kind and loving husband, and inarguably one of the most outstanding human beings any of us have ever had the privilege of knowing and loving. Jack came to be the father that my own father never could be and set a wonderful example by living life with humility, <laughs> kindness, compassion, and integrity. <laughs> I'm sorry. Traits that he has passed on to both of his wonderful sons who have in turn passed them on to their own children. <laughs> Over the past 20 years, the Larkins have embraced me and treated me as one of their own. <laughs> I'm incredibly fortun fortunate to be able to call this family my own and to have called Jack my dad. I love you, Dad, and I'll miss you so much, but I promise to cherish and take care of your most prized possession, your family, and to live my life the way you lived yours, by holding my loved ones close, being forgiving and never holding a grudge always lending a helping hand and treating others with kindness and generosity. Thank you. Our grandfather was a, an amazing man. He used to always Our grandfather Our grandfather was an amazing man. We used to always play games and read books together. He always had something good to say to you and was very optimistic. He was very loving. We love you and miss you. Goodbye. Thank you. 
I, you know, when I, when I left that hymn out, it was that absent-minded professor I was channeling, so. <laughs> There's a, a custom in the Republic of Georgia when they serve dinner that the hostess sits down and dumps half her glass of wine on the tablecloth and says, all right, I've already made a mess. Nobody worry about it from now on. <laughs> I already made a mess, so we can all relax. Um, it's amazing to, to learn about uh, the parts of Jack that I did not have the opportunity to meet. He, it is amazing and an honor to hear uh, the stories of such a multifaceted, layered, and textured human being. Um, I exchanged emails with Reverend, Reverend Linda Michelle this week. She is the pastor of the Congregational Church in Princeton. And one of an amazing number of people who went to the United Church of Ware and ended up going into ordained ministry. Uh, an amazing number of people. And what she said was, I loved Jack reading remarks a pastor from the 1800s made about the need for congregants to clean up their peanut shells and other garbage they left in the pews <laughs> and how dogs could no longer be allowed to roam the aisles. <laughs> and um, at, at, over at the house uh, a week ago, uh, you, Dan, you commented on, on how many friends your dad had who were clergy. And I got to thinking about the conversations we'd had, and I, the only people I know who have more clerical friends than your father are other clergy. It's, it's really pretty amazing. I spent a few years in Worcester as a hospice chaplain, and Jack and I would get together for lunch over there. We would meet at the uh, American Antiquarian Society, which some of you may never have heard of, because I sure hadn't before I got there. We, we'd find a restaurant, we'd sit down, we'd kind of get caught up, and after I came here to Second Congregational Church, we'd meet at a Chinese restaurant out on the way to Brimfield there every month or so, and we'd chat. We'd talk about um, politics, religion, our families, our work, politics, religion, <laughs> our parents, our childhoods, and politics and religion. Um, I loved uh, the obituary that you all wrote for Jack. It was phenomenal. The one that was in the uh, Springfield paper, the Worcester paper, and I believe at least the Ware River News. Um, I, the, the phrase raging intellect. It nailed something, the two words that I've never seen put together before that could not fit better. Um, and, and I thought of the times when he was enraged. What, I don't mean really enraged and like throwing glasses around the restaurant and stuff like that. But not, and not just his intellect, but when uh, his spirit was offended. And I, in general, I, it seemed to be around two things. Um, one was hypocrisy, uh, whether it was in politics or in religion. And in particular, leaders in either politics or religion who were in a position to make a real difference, had promised to make a difference, and then chose expediency or safety over real action. That made him mad. Um, and the uh, failure with the stewardship of power. The other was that, that made him mad was injustice on any front, unfairness. Um, in Jack's mind, as in Barbara's mind, um, there is a place at the table for everyone. Everyone belongs at the table. And if someone's left out of the table, if someone's cut out of that picture, that's the very definition of injustice. Everybody belongs. That's something that's wrong and it needs to be fixed. And you could hear that in the readings from Matthew and from the prophet Micah. And I think of Jack's work as a historian and the journal he discovered of Minerva Mayo in Orange, Massachusetts, a young woman who, whose life uh, appears to have ended at her own hand at the age of 19 and how that captured his imagination. Uh, it's called The Life and Writings of Minerva Mayo by Herself, 1820 to 1822. Um, and Jack helped uh, annotate that uh, and over at Stur Old Sturbridge Village. Um, it inspired his imagination about how, how difficult it was to grow up in that era. Uh, clearly, being a, a social historian wasn't just a uh, coffee table conversation for Jack. It was not an abstract pursuit. In a way, it was uh, an extension, ex an expression of his pursuit of justice. Uh, by calling attention to the people and the places and the events that much of historical scholarship largely ignored. Um, his writing style, in case you haven't read it, is incredibly accessible. Um, I read The Reshaping of Everyday Life, which is one of the books down here. I think it's on the, just to the right of the urn there. Um, it doesn't have any pictures, and I still liked it. 
I mean, it's the, and the other books have pictures, so how cool is that? <laughs> and it was so accessible to make, to make such uh, multifaceted and, and complicated stuff so accessible. Well, I, I met um, Adelpha, it was a different time and place when I met Jack and Barbara. It was at the United Church of Ware. And they visited one Sunday, and they were sitting on the center aisle uh, to the preacher's left, maybe about, would be about the equivalent of five or six rows back here. Um, and they were singing the hymns in parts. And Beverly uh, had the good sense and the leg speed and the, ag and the agility <laughs> to grab them before they got out the door and invite them to sing in the church choir. <laughs> and so um, I, I was at the privilege and joy and delight of standing next to Jack, of sitting next to Jack, singing in the choir at the United Church of Ware. Um, and what, what Jack, uh, his gift to me, was when the tenors came in, I sang the tenor part too, when the tenors came in on, a, on an oddball note that wasn't being played by the piano or the organ, Jack could nail those notes. He, he could find them in his head and sing them. I couldn't. I had to follow him. And, and um, he saved me. Uh, I can't tell you how many times. And singing, make no doubt about it, that was how John, uh, Jack uh, encountered God um, in his life. It was the act of singing. Of course, he would, he would comment um, after we sang a, an anthem or a hymn, he would uh, offer his own observation about the theology or the Christology of, of what that song, and, and sometimes more than just a comment. Um, he was a, more, uh, more comfortable with a low Christology than he was with a high Christology, if that makes sense to any of you. This is a man who had more depth and breadth in his reading as a historian in the fields of theology and philosophy than I as a seminary graduate did. His recall, as John mentioned, was stunning. What he could pull up at a moment's notice. Um, it was amazing. And he loved, he loved uh, all his life the beauty of the Latin Mass in the Roman Catholic Church. Just how the cadence, uh, the music, the rhythm of it uh, was... In the end, it wasn't any particular style of music that was of ultimate importance to Jack. It was the act of singing that opened... Jack's heart and mind to the presence of God. Uh, you could see it in the very way that he sang. Uh, whether it was a United Church of Ware choir, the Second Congregational Church choir, or Brimfield Area Master Singers, the whole choir would be standing, as we did today, standing with our folders in front of us, and the only thing you can see move are our jaws. Our chins go up and down, and uh, maybe our lips, our cheeks flap a little bit, but pretty much it's all the movement is right here. Not so with Jack. Jack, you know, would be swaying side to side and up and down as he sang, and he would, he would emphasize the notes and some of the words with the gestures of his head. He couldn't sit still. It was singing gave an unambiguous expression of the music that was always in his soul. It was always there. And I will always remember how Jack would hit the high, we'd sing the doxology after the offering, and he would hit that, that last high tenor note and, and it, it went from the choir loft all the way to the back of the church, and it was great. Jack sang that, and, and it was from his spirit. Having said that, obviously there's more than music to Jack's life. There was, and he could not talk about witnessing the births of Dan and Tim without welling up with emotion. Uh, that changed his life. Um, or, or as they might have said 10 years ago, it rocked his world. He felt incredibly blessed that his sons were able to marry the women that they loved with all of their hearts, and even more blessed that Jack and Barbara love both of you too, and how, what a blessing that is for a family. And he knew that that was a gift. And he would share, as any uh, nauseating grandparent would, <laughs> the stages of development and the, the activities of Noah, Eli, Owen, Graham, and Annabelle. He recognized how different each of you were from one another, how different you were from your parents. Um, he didn't make any assumptions about it. He just loved getting to know you better and better every time you all got together. He loved that. He would talk about that over lunch. It was great. And I could see the warmth in his eyes just last week as Annabelle held his hand as he was lying in bed. Amazing. And over the course of his treatment for cancer, uh, more than at other times in, in Jack's life, he remarked, many times how grateful he was for Barbara's strength and just 
one foot in front of the other and we're going to get on with this. And that, that kept him on course. That kept him where he needed and wanted to be. I happened to be over there on, on Maundy Thursday, which was the day before uh, Jack died. Um, and I, uh, it was Dan and Barbara and I, and I don't know if Annabelle was in there at the moment, um, but Jack said, I've, I've got something to say, and I felt like I was overhearing sort of a conversation that was meant uh, be for, to be between him and Barbara. And he, he said, you know, I, I got three things here. One, hold fast to being anti-war. And, and I think he was speaking to you, Barbara, more than anything. And then he also said to Barbara, whatever you do, love both of our sons equally. That's not a challenge. And number three, never, ever do anything to support the Yankees. <laughs> I, I kid you not. It's like, what? So, and, and if you see, if you saw the video at the funeral home last night, it was always the big red B on the front of the hat there, the Boston Red Sox. The, um, the Chorus of Saints um, now has a husband, a father, a grandfather, a scholar, a historian, a true tenor whose voice will lift all those around him like a rising tide lifts all souls. Thanks be to God for the life of Jack Larkin. Um, my dad was a well-read man. That's understating it. Um, there are a few things you could you couldn't have an engaging conversation discussion with him about. Um, he loved James Joyce. He loved Herman Melville, Wallace Stevens, T.S. Eliot, Emerson, Thoreau. Um, but the work he had read and reread the most, probably closest to his heart, was *The Lord of the Rings*. And <laughs> it, it's it's funny because this seems this sort of pop culture or lowbrow fantasy thing about elves and orcs. Um, but it, it was uh, one of his passions and interests he shared with me. Um, something I'll forever associate with him. Um, but it's really not that strange. It's something I was thinking about it today. Um, it really embodies the best of dad. It's sweeping romanticism. His dad was surely romantic. The history rich backstory, love of language, and poetry. I'm doing this. Um, the heart of it all, though, The Lord of the Rings is a story of the importance of little people. And it's not far removed at all from people whose everyday life was central to his scholarship, this work. But Dad said to me often, he wasn't sure about the afterlife, but he wanted it to be a lot how the elves went out to sea at the end of the book. Um, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to read from Tolkien at church. Um, and yes, said Gandalf, it will be better to ride back three together than one alone. Well, here at last, dear friends, on the shores of the sea comes the end of our fellowship in Middle Earth. Go in peace. I will not say, do not weep, for not all tears are an evil. And then Frodo kissed Mary and Pippin, last of all Sam, and went aboard. And the sails were drawn up, and the wind blew, and slowly the ship slipped away down the long gray firth, and the light of the glass of Galadriel that Frodo bore glimmered and was lost. And the ship went out to the high sea and passed on into the west until at last on a night of rain Frodo smelled a sweet fragrance on the air and heard the sound of ringing that came over the water and it seemed to him that in his dream the gray rain curtain turned all in silver glass and was rolled back and he beheld white shores and beyond them a far green country under a swift sunrise but to Sam the evening deepened to darkness as he stood at the haven as he looked at the gray sea he saw only a shadow on the waters that was soon lost in the west and there he stood far into the night, hearing only the sigh and the murmur of the waves on the shores of Middle Earth, and the sound of them sank deep into his heart. Thank you, Dad.
Thank you, Dan. So much has been said by John and Adeltha and Noah and Bruce and Dan that I don't have much to add. But I want to say just one thing, and that is that Jack did a brilliant job of keeping the lives of people alive who had died more than a century before. He did such a brilliant job by ferreting out the minutiae of the ways that they lived from moment to moment in their lives. So today I want to remember the minute details of who Jack was, the certain way he would shake his head when he was just about to sing out loud, or the way that he would put a hand to an ear when he wanted to make sure he had the part just right, or when he was contemplating a thought that he would put his hand on his chin, or the way his eyes would light up with glee when he would newly discover some fact of historical life and he was about to tell us about it, or the way he would blink when he was so full of emotion and overcome with the sentiment of love that he had for his sons and daughters-in-laws and grandchildren and for his beloved Barbara. He was so wonderful at remembering the great cloud of witnesses. And so today we remember that great cloud of witnesses and Jack is included, and they have run their course in faith and finished their labors, and now they rest. And we, too, are encouraged by this cloud of witnesses, and we are invited to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to them as examples, the pioneers and perfectors looking to the example that Jack gave us of kindness and humility and a passion for history and for story and most of all for love of community. So I thank you for being here, all of you for being here, for you represent that community of love that was so important to Jack. Thanks be to God for all these things. Amen. I invite the choir to come forward for the anthem, We Are Not Alone.
Let us pray. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer, giver of life and conqueror of death, we praise you with humble hearts, with faith in your great mercy and wisdom, we entrust Jack Larkin to your eternal care. We praise you for your steadfast love for him all the days of his life. And we thank you for all that he was to those who loved him. We thank you that for Jack, all sickness and sorrow are ended and death is past and he has entered the home where all your people gather in peace. Keep us all in communion with your faithful people in every time and place, that at last we may rejoice together in the heavenly family, where Jesus Christ reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And we pray together the prayer that Christ Jesus taught us, praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
You may be seated. And we want to give um, a warm thank you to the choir um, who provided such beautiful music and to Len who will be offering the benediction in song. 